Chapter Two of the Beasts of Tarzan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter Two Marooned. As Tarzan and his guide had disappeared into the shadows upon the dark wharf, the figure of a heavily veiled woman had hurried down the narrow alley to the entrance of the drinking place the two men had just quitted. Here she paused and looked about, and then, as though satisfied that she had at last reached the place she sought, she pushed bravely into the interior of the vile den. A score of half-drunken sailors and wharf-rats looked up at the unaccustomed sight of a richly gowned woman in their midst. Rapidly she approached the slovenly barmaid, who stared half in envy, half in hate, at her more fortunate sister. "'Have you seen a tall, well-dressed man here, but a minute since?' she asked. "'Who met another and went away with him?' The girl answered in the affirmative, but could not tell which way the two had gone. A sailor, who had approached to listen to the conversation, vouchsafed the information that a moment before, as he had been about to enter the pub, he had seen two men leaving it, who walked towards the wharf. "'Show me the direction they went,' cried the woman slipping a coin into the man's hand. The fellow led her from the place, and together they walked quickly toward the wharf and along it until across the water they saw a small boat just pulling into the shadows of a nearby steamer. "'There they be,' whispered the man. Ten pounds if you will find a boat and row me to that steamer,' cried the woman. "'Quickly, then,' he replied, "'for we gotta go to it if we're going to catch the Kincaid before she sails. She's had steam up for three hours and just been a-waitin' for that one passenger.' I was a-talkin' to one of her crew arf an hour ago." As he spoke, he led the way to the end of the wharf, where he knew another boat lay moored, and, lowering the woman into it, he jumped in after and pushed off. The two were soon scudding over the water. At the steamer's side the man demanded his pay, and without waiting to count out the exact amount, the woman thrust a handful of banknotes into his outstretched hand. A single glance at them convinced the fellow that he had been more than well paid. Then he assisted her up the ladder, holding his skiff close to the ship's side against the chance that this profitable passenger might wish to be taken ashore later. But presently the sound of the donkey engine and the rattle of a steel cable on the hoisting drum proclaimed the fact that the Kincaid's anchor was being raised, and a moment later the waiter heard the propellers revolving, and slowly the little steamer moved away from him out into the channel. As he turned to row back to shore, he heard a woman shriek from the ship's deck. That's what I call rotten luck, he soliloquied. I might just as well have add the old bloomin' wad. When Jane Clayton climbed to the deck of the Kincaid, she found the ship apparently deserted. There was no sign of those she sought, nor of any other aboard. And so she went about her search for her husband and the child she hoped against hope to find there without interruption. Quickly she hastened to the cabin, which was half above and half below deck. As she hurried down the short companion ladder into the main cabin, on either side of which were the smaller rooms occupied by the officers. She failed to note the quick closing of one of the doors before her. She passed the full length of the main room, and then retracing her steps stopped before each door to listen, furtively trying each latch. All was silence, utter silence there, in which the throbbing of her own frightened heart seemed to her overwrought imagination to fill the ship with its thunderous alarm. One by one the doors opened before her touch, only to reveal empty interiors. In her absorption she did not note the sudden activity upon the vessel, the purring of the engines, the throbbing of the propeller. She had reached the last door upon the right now, and as she pushed it open she was seized from within by a powerful dark-visaged man, and drawn hastily into the stuffy, ill-smelling interior. The sudden shock of fright which the unexpected attack had upon her drew a single piercing scream from her throat. Then the man clapped a hand roughly over the mouth. "'Not until we are further from land, my dear,' he said. "'Then you may yell your pretty head off.' Lady Greystoke turned to look into the leering bearded face so close to hers. The man relaxed the pressure of his fingers upon her lips, and with a little moan of terror as she recognized him, the girl shrank away from her captor. "'Nicholas Rokoff, M. Thoran,' she exclaimed. "'Your devoted admirer,' replied the Russian, with a low bow. "'My little boy,' she said next, ignoring the terms of endearment. "'Where is he? Let me have him. 
How could you be so cruel, even as you, Nicholas Rokoff, cannot be entirely devoid of mercy and compassion? Tell me where he is. Is he aboard this ship? Oh, please, if such a thing as a heart beats within your breast, take me to my baby. But if you do as you are bid, no harm will befall him, replied Rokoff. But remember that it is your own fault that you are here. You came aboard voluntarily, and you may take the consequences. I little thought, he added to himself, that any such good luck as this would come to me. He went on deck then, locking the cabin door upon his prisoner, and for several days she did not see him. The truth of the matter being that Nicholas Rokoff was so poor a sailor that the heavy seas the Kincaid encountered from the very beginning of her voyage sent the Russian to his berth with a bad attack of seasickness. During this time her only visitor was an uncouth Swede, the Kincaid's unsavory cook, who brought her meals to her. His name was Sven Anderson, his one pride being that his patronymic was spelt with a double S. The man was tall and raw-boned, with a long yellow mustache, an unwholesome complexion, and filthy nails. The very sight of him, with one grimy thumb buried deep in the lukewarm stew that seemed from the frequency of its repetition to constitute the pride of his culinary art, was sufficient to take away the girl's appetite. His small, blue, close-set eyes never met hers squarely. There was a shiftiness of his whole appearance that even found expression in the cat-like manner of his gait, and to it all a sinister suggestion was added by the long, slim knife that always rested at his waist, slipped through the greasy cord that supported his soiled apron. Ostensibly, it was but an implement of his calling, but the girl could never free herself of the conviction that it would require less provocation to witness it put to other and less harmless uses. His manner toward her was surly, yet she never failed to meet him with a pleasant smile and a word of thanks when he brought her food to her, though more often than not she hurled the bulk of it through the tiny cabin port the moment that the door closed behind him. During the days of anguish that followed Jane Clayton's imprisonment, but two questions were uppermost in her mind, the whereabouts of her husband and her son. She fully believed that the baby was aboard the Kincaid, provided that he still lived, but whether Tarzan had been permitted to live after having been lured aboard the evil craft, she could not guess. She knew, of course, the deep hatred that the Russian felt for the Englishman, and she could think of but one reason for having him brought aboard the ship, to dispatch him in comparative safety and revenge for his having thwarted Rokoff's pet schemes, and for having been at last the means of landing him in a French prison. Tarzan, on his part, lay in the darkness of his cell, ignorant of the fact that his wife was a prisoner in the cabin almost above his head. The same Swede that served Jane brought his meals to him, but, though on several occasions Tarzan had tried to draw the man into conversation, he had been unsuccessful. He had hoped to learn through this fellow whether his little son was aboard the Kincaid, but to every question upon this or kindred subjects the fellow returned but one reply, I think it blow pretty soon pretty hard, so after several attempts Tarzan gave it up. For weeks that seemed months to the two prisoners, the little steamer forged on they knew not where. Once the Kincaid stopped to coal, only immediately to take up the seemingly interminable voyage. Rokoff had visited Jane Clayton but once since he had locked her in the tiny cabin. He had come gaunt and hollow-eyed from a long siege of seasickness. The object of his visit was to obtain from her her personal check for a large sum in return for a guarantee of her personal safety, and return to England. When you set me down safely in any civilized port, together with my son and my husband, she replied, I will pay you in gold twice the amount you ask. But until then you shall not have a cent, nor the promise of a cent, under any other conditions. You will give me the check I ask, he replied with a snarl, or neither you nor your child nor your husband will ever again set foot within any port, civilized or otherwise. I would not trust you, she replied. What guarantee have I that you would not take my money and then do as you please with me and mine, regardless of your promise? I think you will do as I bid, he said, turning to leave the cabin. Remember that I have your son. If you chance to hear the agonized wail of a tortured child, it may console you to reflect that it is because of your stubbornness that the baby suffers, and that it is your baby. You would not do it, cried the girl. You would not, could not, be so fiendishly cruel. It is not I that am cruel, but you, he returned, for you permit a paltry sum of money to stand between your baby and immunity from suffering. The end of it was that Jane Clayton wrote out a check of large denomination and handed it to Nicholas Rokoff who left her cabin with a grin of satisfaction upon his lips. The following day the hatch was removed from Tarzan's cell, 
and as he looked up he saw Paulvitch's head framed in the square of light above him. Come up, commanded the Russian, but bear in mind that you will be shot if you make a single move to attack me or any other aboard the ship. The ape-man swung himself lightly to the deck. About him, but at a respectful distance, stood a half-dozen sailors armed with rifles and revolvers. Facing him was Paulvitch. Tarzan looked about for Rokoff, who he felt sure must be aboard, but there was no sign of him. Lord Greystoke, commenced the Russian, by your continued and wanton interference with M. Rokoff and his plans, you have at last brought yourself and your family to this unfortunate extremity. You have only yourself to thank. As you may imagine, it has cost M. Rokoff a large amount of money to finance this expedition, and, as you are the sole cause of it, he naturally looks to you for reimbursement. Further, I may say that only by meeting M. Rokoff's just demands may you avert the most unpleasant consequences to your wife and child, and at the same time retain your own life and regain your liberty. What is the amount? asked Tarzan, and what assurance have I that you will live up to your end of the agreement? I have little reason to trust two such scoundrels as you and Rokoff, you know. The Russian flushed. You are in no position to deliver insults, he said. You have no assurance that we will live up to our agreement other than my word. But you have before you the assurance that we can make short work of you if you do not write out the check we demand. Unless you are a greater fool than I imagine, you should know that there is nothing that would give us greater pleasure than to order these men to fire. That we do not is because we have other plans for punishing you that would be entirely upset by your death. Answer one question, said Tarzan. Is my son on board this ship? No replied Alexis Paulvitch. Your son is quite safe elsewhere, nor will he be killed until you refuse to accede to our fair demands. If it becomes necessary to kill you, there will be no reason for not killing the child, since with you gone, the one whom we wish to punish through the boy will be gone, and he will then be to us only a constant source of danger and embarrassment. You see, therefore, that you may only save the life of your son by saving your own, and you can only save your own by giving us the check we ask. Very well, replied Tarzan, for he knew that he could trust them to carry out any sinister threat that Paulvitch had made, and there was a bare chance that by conceding their demands he might save the boy. That they would permit him to live after he had appended his name to the check never occurred to him as being within the realms of probability, but he was determined to give him such a battle as they would never forget, and possibly to take Paulvitch with him into eternity. He was only sorry that it was not Rokoff. He took his pocket checkbook and fountain pen from his pocket. What is the amount? he asked. Paulvitch named an enormous sum. Tarzan could scarce restrain a smile. Their very cupidity was to prove the means of their undoing, in the matter of the ransom at least. Purposely he hesitated and haggled over the amount, but Paulvitch was obdurate. Finally the ape-man wrote out his check for a larger sum than stood to his credit at the bank. As he turned to hand the worthless slip of paper to the Russian, his glance chanced to pass across the starboard bow of the Kincaid. To his surprise, he saw that the ship lay within a few hundred yards of land. Almost down to the water's edge ran a dense tropical jungle, and behind was a higher land clothed in forest. Paulvitch noted the direction of his gaze. You are to be set at liberty here, he said. Tarzan's plan for immediate physical revenge upon the Russian vanished. He thought the land before him the mainland of Africa and he knew that should they liberate him here, he could doubtless find his way to civilization with comparative ease. Paulvitch took the check. Remove your clothing, he said to the ape-man. Here you will not need it. Tarzan demurred. Paulvitch pointed to the armed sailors, then the Englishman slowly divested himself of his clothing. A boat was lowered, and still heavily guarded, the ape-man was rowed ashore. Half an hour later, the sailors had returned to the Kincaid, and the steamer was slowly getting under way. As Tarzan stood upon the narrow strip of beach watching the departure of the vessel, he saw a figure appear at the rail and call aloud to attract his attention. The ape-man had been about to read a note that one of the sailors had handed him as the small boat that bore him to the shore was on the point of returning to the steamer. But at the hail from the vessel's deck he looked up. He saw a black-bearded man who laughed at him in derision as he held high above his head the figure of a little child. Tarzan half started as though to rush through the surf and strike out for the already moving steamer, but realizing the futility of so rash an act, he halted at the water's edge. Thus he stood, his gaze riveted upon the Kincaid, until it disappeared beyond the projecting promontory of the coast. 
From the jungle at his back, fierce bloodshot eyes glared from beneath shaggy, overhanging brows upon him. Little monkeys in the treetops chattered and scolded, and from the distance of the inland forest came the scream of a leopard. But still John Clayton, Lord Greystoke, stood deaf and unseeing, suffering the pangs of keen regret for the opportunity that he had wasted because he had been so gullible as to place credence in a single statement of the first lieutenant of his arch-enemy. I have at least, he thought, one consolation, the knowledge that Jane is safe in London. Thank heaven she, too, did not fall into the clutches of those villains. Behind him, the hairy thing whose evil eyes had been watching his as a cat watches a mouse was creeping stealthily toward him. Where were the trained senses of the savage ape-man? Where the acute hearing? Where the uncanny sense of scent? End of chapter 2